Four. It is now time for question period. The leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition now. Now? <laughs> Good morning uh, again, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Acting Premier. The Financial Accountability Office was very concerned about the Liberal Hydro financing scheme and asked MPPs to make certain the Auditor General approved. But not only did the Auditor say the scheme does not meet accounting standards, she said that to flow the costs through Ontario Power Generation, as the scheme called for, uh, will add four billion dollars. Wow. She said, "Quote: We're talking four billion dollars more wow. than needed just to get an accounting result." Now, the Globe and Mail is taking this scandal national with a damning indictment of this government's practices. Mr. Speaker, now that the Liberal scheme has been disclosed, Question? will the government okay. follow the law and save the Ontario taxpayers four billion dollars? Yeah, 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 yeah. Speaker, Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, pleased to rise and once again talk about the policy choice that we made as a government, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we continue to have a reliable electricity system, a clean electricity system, Mr. Speaker, and an affordable electricity system for the ratepayers of today and for the ratepayers of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. And the Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, the plan that we brought forward keeps the cost of borrowing within the rate base, not the tax base, Mr. Speaker, because that's the logical thing to do, Mr. Speaker. The policies and the implementation process for the Fair Hydro Plan were designed and extensively reviewed by senior bureaucrat officials, Mr. Speaker, from the Ministry of Energy, from the Ministry of Finance, from the Treasury Board Secretariat, from the Office of the Provincial Controller, from Cabinet Office, Answer. from the Ontario Financial Authority, from the ISO, Mr. Speaker, from the Ontario Power Generation, and we worked with third-party experts with firms such Thank as you. KPMG, e and Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you. Back to the acting premier. The logical thing to do is not spend the extra four billion dollars. The Globe and Mail clearly illustrates that not only will Ontario families pay tens of billions of dollars for this Liberal Hydro scheme, but the secret accounting will cost taxpayers four billion dollars more. The article reads, "Quote: Andre Lauren, the C.D. Howe Institute's research director, said he'd never before encountered such a convoluted arrangement in the." Public sphere. To him, the use of related party transactions between multiple entities resembles tax avoidance schemes in the private sector. Quote, the same accountants that are advising the government are advising the private sector to build other types of complex accounting structures, he told the Globe. How crazy is this, really? Mr. Speaker, will the government come clean on what the Globe and Mail has titled, quote, bad books? The President of the Treasury Board, Mr. Speaker. President of Thank, you, uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know that the uh, members opposite are anxious to hear the answer. That's why they asked the question. Speaker, our government presents the province's finances fairly and accurately and in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards. And the impact of the Fair Hydro Plan will be transparent in the consolidated financial statements of our province. At the core of this issue, Speaker, is a technical issue about whether or not the IESO is a rate-regulated agency and should thus use rate-regulated accounting. The Auditor General does not believe that the IESO should use rate-regulated accounting, and we respectfully disagree, Speaker. Instead, the AG is advocating for an accounting practice that shields $17 billion in market transactions over which the IESO has oversight, and those are now transparent, Speaker, and in the public domain. In closing, Speaker, I know the Answer. member opposite mentioned the public. They're waiting, as are we, with Speaker, with bated breath to see what the other side is going to do about hydro, Speaker. We've yet to hear. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final well, back to the Deputy Premier. It's transparent, all right. We saw right through it. In a statement to the Globe, KPMG emphasized it had no formal role in selecting or approving Ontario's accounting policies, nor did Deloitte. Ernst & Young declined to answer questions about its work, according to the Globe and Mail. Yet the Energy Minister keeps saying 
All of them have approved this government's scheme. All of the firms deny that. Mr. Speaker, do we need another gas plant style scandal hearings to get to the truth yet again? The Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I'm pleased to rise and talk about the work that we have done with our accounting firms, Mr. Speaker, and the policies and the implementation process for the Fair Hydro Plan were designed and extensively reviewed, as I said before, Mr. Speaker, by ENY, KPMG, and Deloitte. In conjunction with that, Mr. Speaker, we worked extensively with the senior bureaucratic officials, Mr. Speaker, within my ministry, within the Ministry of Finance, within the Treasury Board Secretariat, the Office of the Provincial Controller, the Cabinet Office, Mr. Speaker, as well as the Ontario Financial Authority and the Independent Electricity System Operator and, of course, Mr. Speaker, OPG. Through this work, we considered a range of implementation options and ensured that due diligence, Mr. Speaker, was completed. Yes, Once again, these were policy choices that we made to ensure that that we continue to have a clean, reliable, and affordable electricity system. Thank you. Listen carefully to the round of three questions, and we're in warnings. New question from Hastings. Speaker, my question this morning is for the Minister of Energy. If the $4 billion wasted on the Liberals' unfair hydro plan isn't outrageous enough, Ontarians were shocked last week to learn that the Hydro One board secretly inserted a poison pill into the contract of the Hydro One CEO that would allow him to cash in $10 million in severance on the way out the door should he be fired. Mr. Speaker, when was the Minister of Energy aware of this $10 million severance package? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that executive salaries are high compared to the vast majority of Ontario salaries and remain committed to Hydro One's regulation, accountability, Mr. Speaker, and transparency. I'm serious. Finish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Accountability and transparency through our government's involvement as a majority shareholder. That said, Mr. Speaker, Doug Ford knows very well that Hydro One is now a publicly traded company, not a government entity, and his rhetoric won't take one cent, not one cent, off electricity bills. The member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry is warned. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One's governance agreement is publicly available, and we urge the Conservatives and Doug Ford to read it. Its purpose is to ensure that the structure of Hydro One benefits ratepayers and has allowed them to yes, find sir. $114 million in savings, translating to lower electricity rates, end winter disconnections, enhance customer service. Speaker, and I'll get Thank more you. in the supplementary. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it was the Liberal government who sold Hydro One when more than 80 percent of taxpayers said that it was the wrong thing to do for the future of the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it was the Premier who said time and time again. The member from Niagara Falls is warned. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, it was the Premier who said time and time again in this House that the government retained the right to fire the board Sorry. and the CEO at Hydro One. Yet, this occurred behind closed doors, a $10 million severance package for the $6 million man should he be fired. My question to the Minister of Energy, did he even know about this secret question. arrangement at the board? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we do know about is the 25 per cent savings that we brought to all families. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The 25 per cent savings that we brought to all residents and families right across this province, Mr. Speaker. Again, we recognize that executive salaries are high compared to the vast majority of Ontario sales, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to remain committed to Hydro One's regulation and accountability and transparency through our government's involvement as that majority um, uh, shareholder, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, Mr. Speaker, we continue to be perplexed 
by Doug Ford's out-of-control and erratic scheme to fire the leadership of the company because he hasn't said what his goal is, Mr. Speaker, and how he will leave this, uh, how this will leave the people of Ontario better off, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we know that the rates are set independently by the Ontario Energy Board, not the CEO of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to Thank work you. in the best interest of the people of Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I don't know how the Minister of Energy does it. I don't know how. Every day during question period, he goes round and round and round and round like a broken record. But where was he when the people of Ontario were getting hit with $4 billion more than they should have on the Liberals' unfair hydro plan? And where was he when this secret deal was being cooked up by the board at Hydro One to hand out a $10 million severance package to the $6 million man, the CEO and president of Hydro One? Where was he? He can spin like a broken record in the House, but does he believe it was the right thing to do to put a secret deal together for $10 million? <laughs> The Minister, of, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and uh, Reconcil the Minister of Indigenous and Reconciliation is warned. Minister, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've been standing here right in this House helping the people of Ontario as they vote against every single thing that we do to bring forward an affordable electricity system, Mr. Speaker. Making sure that we eliminate coal, they vote against that, Mr. Speaker. Bringing in a 25 per cent reduction for families, they vote against it, Mr. Speaker. I have three on my mind, but I'll go for one. The member from Huron, Bruce, is warned. And I think he knows who I have in my mind. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, when we brought forward minimum wage to help families and help individuals across this province, Mr. Speaker, they actually voted against it. We know where we stand when it comes to the people of Ontario. We stand shoulder to shoulder with them, Mr. Speaker. They vote against everything they can to make sure that it makes life more difficult for the people of this province. We will continue to work, Mr. Speaker, for the people of Ontario. You know what, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to making sure that the electricity system is clean, reliable and affordable, Mr. Speaker. It is this government that brought forward the Fair Hydro Plan that has actually Thanks, helped sir. the people of Ontario. We'll continue to do what's right for the people of this province, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New, new question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you. Thank you. My question is to the Acting Premier. After 15 years of underfunding hospitals, including five years of frozen operating budgets for hospitals, does the Premier realize, does this government realize, that you have created a crisis in health care in the province of Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our budget uh, this year has laid out precisely what we in intend to do, and that is continue to invest in hospital funding, as we have each and every year since we took office. And in this particular budget, we're making a historic investment of an additional $822 million in Ontario's publicly funded hospitals. This amounts to an increase overall on average of 4.6 per cent, and this will increase capacity, decrease wait time, times, and improve access to care for families across Ontario. So we are directly benefiting people living in Ontario, increasing their access to Answer. care in our hospitals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much. Uh, again, to the Acting Premier or the Minister, the Premier's budget was more about trying to get headlines than trying to fix the problems that this Liberal government has created. The CEO of Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare said, and I quote, hospital funding has not kept pace with many new and rising costs like hydro. The budget is very disappointing and does not address the multi-million dollar operating shortfall that we are projecting. Why doesn't this government get it, Mr. Speaker? Thank you, Minister. So I'm certainly pleased to give some specifics as to what our budget actually will mean for the people of Ontario. It will give patients access to 26,000 additional MRI operating wow. hours, 14,000 more surgical and medical procedures, 3,000 more cardiac procedures, and it will give patients access to more essential services in hospitals like cardiac care, critical care, chemotherapy, and treatment for stroke. It will decrease wait times for hip, knee, 
<coughs> cataract, shoulder, cornea, and spine surgery. We're increasing our investment each and every year. We're doing it in a careful, thoughtful way, depending on the demographics of a particular region. We're looking at that with the lens, and we're increasing our investments. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, in order to address a problem, you actually have to admit that there's a problem. Fifteen years of Liberal decisions have created a crisis in our health care system. It's in all of our ridings. You cannot hide from it. But instead of fixing hospitals, Doug Ford would further privatize health care or just close hospitals or health programs. The Liberals gave the people of this province hallway medicine. Doug Ford is going to give the people of this province parking lot medicine. The good news, that was pretty funny. The good news is that we New Democrats have a plan to fix hospitals and end hallway medicine. But it is important to accept responsibility for what you have created in this province. Will this premier accept responsibility and apologize to the people of this province for creating a crisis in health care in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, hospital funding in Ontario has increased by more than 65 per cent since we took office wow. in 2003. Wow. That's it now is at 19 billion dollars. In the past two years alone, we've increased operational funding to hospitals by almost one billion dollars. And also last year, we committed an additional nine billion dollars to support hospital infrastructure as part of our plan to invest 19 billion dollars in capital grants to hospitals over the next 10 years to keep our system sustainable for years to come. Healthcare is a very complex issue, Mr. Speaker. We are doing our part when it comes to hospital funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. New Democrats have a pharmacare plan for everyone. It will cover 90% of prescriptions, and no one is left behind. It is actually pharmacare for everyone. Why doesn't the Premier believe in universal pharmacare? Here, here. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, certainly our government is committed at the end of the day, hopefully, to have a national universal pharma yeah. care program. Well, we on this side of the House, being the type of responsible government that we are, are moving incrementally towards that goal. And so, of course, we did announce our OHIP Plus program that started on uh, January 1st of this year. Uh, free drugs for everyone under the age of 25. The entire uh, uh, number of drugs is 4,400 drugs that are now covered. Uh, we believe this is an excellent st uh, step forward. Over a million prescriptions have already been uh, filled, Mr. Speaker. This is the first step, and of course, I'll elaborate in the supplementary. Okay. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. I don't think incrementally is going to cut it. The Premier and the government have talked about pharmacare, but the reality is the government has had 15 years to act. Why has this Liberal government ignored pharmacare for the last 15 years? Thank you. Minister? Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, of course, uh, we do believe in incremental improvement uh, as a responsible way in terms of uh, uh, building our budget. And so, of course, we have now increased our coverage in OHEP Plus for all seniors over the age of 65. <laughs> be no deductible. This will be of immense benefit, again covering all 4,400 drugs uh, to ensure that uh, no one is left behind. So we have a comprehensive plan. It's going to make a real difference to the health of the community. Uh, I do want to point out that the NDP's plan apparently won't take place. It won't be realized until the year 2020. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. It surprises me that this government defends their junior drug plan and their senior drug plan, and it's not fair to call it pharmacare when they don't actually care about anybody in between. The Premier, the Premier thinks that children should have access to medication, also thinks that they should be cut off when they turn 25. New Democrats don't think so. We don't ask how old you are when you go to the hospital, so we shouldn't care how old you are when you need a prescription. Health care should be universal for a person with diabetes or asthma or HIV or any other chronic illness. They should have drug coverage. They should have coverage on their 25th birthday, their 30th birthday, their 40th, their 50th, and it goes on. Everybody, Speaker, everybody. That is what universal means. So why doesn't the Premier believe in universal pharmacare? Good. Thank you. Minister. 
And Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you will recall in our budget of this year, we took a further step. We introduced coverage for those with no private insurance between the ages of 25 and 65 uh, so that they ha will have 80 per cent of their costs reimbursed for dental and pharma care, uh, $400 for an individual and $700 for a family of four. This is an excellent step forward. More and more excellent. people yeah. are being covered. We have one out of two people in Ontario now covered for Pharmacare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Simple Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Energy. Yesterday, Hydro One's chair released a statement on their egregious $10 million severance package for their $6 million man. Did the Premier or Minister instruct Hydro One to release that statement? And did they coordinate the statement with Hydro One? Yes or no, Minister? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the uh, the board um, is an entity that works on its own, Mr. Speaker, and so um, you know they, they, I wasn't aware that they were releasing that statement. But when it comes to you know Hydro One's um, governance agreement, Mr. Speaker, as I said, that's also publicly available, and we urge the Conservatives uh, to read that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's the fourth question today that the uh, minister's uh, been asked what he knew uh, about the $10 million severance package for the $6 million man, when he knew it, whether this was a coordinated effort uh, between Hydro One and the government. I can't believe, as a former energy minister, that your hydro company wouldn't inform you back in November about such a significant uh, change in the uh, rules of the, of the game over there at Hydro One. Um, Minister, last week uh, the Premier walked out and you uh, ran away from a scrum. So I want to know what you're hiding, why you would walk away from a scrum, and why you're not being forthright with the people of Ontario. You see it, please? Uh, the, the member will withdraw. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I once again was very happy to answer questions to the media and stay there for about 10 minutes, Mr. Speaker. Um, the only person that I know that is doing the dug and dash, as it's starting to get known within the media circles, is the, the leader of the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, who makes sure that when he answers one question and then disappears in a bus, Mr. Speaker, or actually makes the announcement that he's going to fire the CEO and then leaves it to the member from um, Prince Edward Hastings to answer those questions, Mr. Speaker. So I don't have a problem actually talking about our government's record of making sure that we brought forward the Fair Hydro Plan that reduced rates by 25 per cent, Mr. Speaker. And I know that they sneakily snuck that into their, their people's— sneakily snuck, Mr. Speaker, it's new words. Um, Mr. Speaker, you know, they snuck it into the, the, the people's guarantee, Mr. Speaker, and then tossed it aside. Thank you. you know what, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. I, I try not to become emotionally involved in any of these kinds of things. That one got me. New question, the member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Labour. Speaker, once again, this Liberal government says one thing when it comes to being a friend of working people and then does another. Once again, this Liberal government has chosen through omnibus legislation to introduce changes that favour one party to effectively pick a fight and then stand back and watch. In what universe does the Minister of Labour believe that it's appropriate and, frankly, even constitutional for the Minister of the Crown to arbitrarily strip unionized workers of their historic collective bargaining jurisdiction and hand-deliver that jurisdiction to another union? Minister of Labour. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for that very unbiased question. Speaker, in the, uh, in the ICI sector, Speaker, there's been a long-standing dispute between the parties. What we did, Speaker, we went out and we got one of the... We got one of the... Minister. Speaker, we went out, we got one of the preeminent experts on formwork, Speaker, Kevin Burkett. 
world-renowned, internationally famous, somebody in the province of Ontario that people rely on to bring neutrality and fairness. He studied the current circumstances around the ICI formwork sector in the province, and he made recommendations as to how we could move forward, Speaker. We took that advice, Speaker, Answer. and then we took it out again to Mike Mitchell, Speaker, an expert in construction law, asked for specific recommendations, Speaker, Thank and you. that's what's before the House as I speak. Supplementary. Speaker, the Minister of Labour, the Premier and the Minister of Economic Development have concocted this plan in Schedule 14 of the Budget Bill to strip the historic jurisdiction from thousands of Lyuna members in the concrete forming sector of our construction industry. And if you listen closely, you can hear 10,000 of them right now on the front lines ready to fight this, this legislation. Speaker, not only will this cause immediate labour shortages, but it jeopardizes the economic welfare, the pension security of retirees, and the health and safety of workers in this sector. It will also impede the productivity of a sector that has literally built the communities in this province. Speaker, will the minister reverse this draconian legislation and create a level playing field for all workers in this industry, remove the dangerous precedent-setting clause that the Liberal government brought in through their budget legislation? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, as we spent the last couple of years going through this process, Speaker, it's been a long-standing dispute. We've tried to remain as neutral as we possibly can, Speaker. The, uh, the honourable member certainly has taken a side on this, Speaker, and I can, it's clear what side he's coming from, to the detriment of all the carpenters that have worked along with us on this as well, Speaker. So very clearly, I can see that there's one side being represented here. Our job is to represent both sides, Speaker. That's why we bought in the arbitrator. Why we bought the experts, Speaker. Their recommendations. Sorry, Speaker. <clears throat> Finish, please, wrap. Speaker, their recommendations is to level the playing field and ensure that we have continued fairness in the province of Ontario. Northern Eastern Ontario, no change, Speaker. Answer. Southwestern Ontario, no change affecting the Labour's or collective agreements. And in the expanded GTA, Speaker, we're enforcing the. Thank you. New question. Member from Lancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Westdale. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Labour. Uh, Minister, spring is, uh, is seemingly finally arrived, and it's now time for students around the province to look for summer jobs. In my area, the folks at uh, the Goodwill Career Centre work hard each year to help students find jobs across the city. Last year, they placed over 300 students into summer jobs, and this year, the demand has increased. The Goodwill Career Centre Center's message is, if you're between 15 and 29 and you're looking for employment, we can help. I believe that many of these jobs pay minimum wage, which is now much higher than it was last summer. It is so encouraging that despite what we've heard from critics, students in my riding are benefiting from a thriving summer job market and increased minimum wage. Question. Minister, can you please tell us more about what we can expect to see around the province as a result of the increase in the minimum Thank wage? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Westdale, for that question, Speaker. Speaker, we all know the previous Conservative government froze the minimum wage, $6.85, Speaker, for nearly 10 years when they were in charge, Speaker. As a result, people in this province who were working sometimes 35, 40 hours a week, sometimes two or three jobs just to get by, Speaker, could not get by. We knew we had to do better. That's why we raised the minimum wage 12 times, Speaker, since 2003. It's now more than doubled that it was when it was frozen for all those years under the previous government. But we know at the same time the economy of the province of Ontario has grown. Our province is leading the G7 when it comes to economic growth. Unemployment numbers as low as we've seen in years, Speaker. 820,000 new yes, jobs. Sir. And thanks to the minimum wage, Speaker, more Ontarians are able to benefit from that growth. That's something we should be proud of, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Sure. Uh, I've seen that firsthand in my community, and while we have businesses expanding and creating wealth, not everyone was seeing the benefits of the growth. There were parents who were working full-time and finding it difficult to provide the essentials to their family, let alone save to get ahead in the future. 
The increase to a $15 minimum wage means that they can more easily take care of themselves and their families. I found it disappointing when our colleagues in the opposition voted against increasing the minimum wage, even more so when their leader promised he would roll it back. The simple fact is that these families cannot afford a rollback of the $15 minimum wage. They cannot afford the leader of the opposition's plan to take money out of their pockets. Minister, can you detail how our plan is different? Thank you. Minister. Thank you again to the member for this very important question to people, Speaker, who need help a lot. Our plan is simple. What we're going to do is raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour of January 1st of next year. That is different, Speaker, from the Leader of the, of the Opposition. He promises to roll that back, Speaker, and to take that money directly out of the wallets of working people. Speaker, this is money they rely on to put food on the table, keep a roof over their heads. It's lunch money, Speaker. It's money for shoes for the kids' feet. These are the families that need our help, Speaker. These are the people that rely on this. And at the same time, economists have already settled that an increase to, the, to a $15 hour minimum wage means more money for workers after taxes. Nothing the Leader of the Opposition can say by taking that money away from these people changes that fact. We know it's the time to invest in yes, things sir. that are going to help families. While they focus on making the rich richer speaker, we're focusing on efforts like the minimum wage and OHIP+. Plus. Good question. The member from Leeds Grenville. Uh, thanks, here, here. Thanks, Speaker. My uh, question is to the acting premier. The Liberals have held a total of 39 campaign-style announcements. Oh, it's an expensive At an estimated question. cost of $7,500 each event, that brings the total amount spent campaigning on the taxpayer's dime by the Liberals to $292,500. Climbing fast. The Liberals are now under investigation by Elections Ontario. Wow. These events have to stop. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberal Party pay back the taxpayer? Here, here. Thank you. Back to the Premier. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I appreciate the question uh, from the member opposite. Um, I, I think the member opposite uh, is a bit exaggerating what Elections Ontario have said in terms of uh, their uh, sort of uh, boilerplate response they gave when they, when they received complaints, uh, like the one they have received from the Conservatives. Uh, Speaker, um, and, uh, uh, Speaker, our focus is, is to make sure that we are talking about this very important budget, this budget that actually provides for a plan for care and opportunity for the people of Ontario, a budget that ensures that the people of Ontario get an increase in their minimum wage to $15 an hour by January 1, 2019, that ensures that uh, farmer care is expanded to our seniors, 65 uh, and more, yeah. not to mention, Speaker, investment in building new hospitals, making wait times uh, down. The reason Answer. Speaker, the member opposite and the, the Conservatives don't want to talk about that is because they're going to cut all those important services that are so deserving for the people of Ontario. Uh, back to Making the uh, acting premier. It up. Speaker, this government is so desperate to cling to power, they'll stoop to never before seen lows. There's no amount of taxpayers' dollars that they won't use for their own self serving needs. Speaker, how much more taxpayer dollars will this government spend campaigning? How many? How many more? Thank you. Ladies. Acting premier. Speaker, clearly the Conservatives you know, had a busy weekend and they're trying to do everything in their power to deflect from the scandals that emerge, continue to emerge and, uh, from their own parties. Uh, Speaker, uh, it's, it's questions that people are asking about them, like is it the sudden nomination of 11 Conservative candidates entirely bypassing the Democratic nomination process? Is it, Speaker, the share ashamed about commitment to removing all safe injection sites if elected, sites that have saved lives of those suffering from mental health and addiction issues? Is it, Speaker, the commitment to undo police oversight in our province that was recently passed by this House? Oversight. Have that uh, discussion outside of the House. Answer, please. Or is it, Speaker, the nomination of somebody like Tanya Granik Allen in as part of their party, who is known to take anti-Muslim stand, who is known to take an uh, anti-woman stand, as Speaker? That's what they're trying to distract from. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the acting premier. Over the weekend, an investigation by the Globe and Mail confirmed what the NDP has been saying for the past year. 
The Premier is wasting $4 billion on a complicated private financing scheme whose sole purpose is to conceal the fact that she's using debt to artificially lower hydro bills prior to the election. After the election, hydro bills will skyrocket yet again, rising by more than 70 per cent over the next 10 years. Ontario families and businesses will be forced to pay back the billions in hydro debt plus another $21 billion in interest. Why is the Premier spending billions of dollars to mislead Ontarians into believing she's lowering hydro The uh, member will withdraw. Uh, withdraw, Speaker. On. Why is the Premier spending billions of dollars Answer. when, over the long run, She's actually driving hydro bills up even higher. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, once again, we reiterate the fact that we made a policy choice, Mr. Speaker. This government made a policy choice to ensure that we continue to have clean, reliable, and affordable electricity, Mr. Speaker, for ratepayers of today and for ratepayers of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. And the Fair Hydro Plan keeps the cost of borrowing, Mr. Speaker, um, within the rate base, Mr. Speaker, not the tax base. And we did that, Mr. Speaker, because that's the logical thing to do, Mr. Speaker. That's how it's been done um, for decades, Mr. Speaker. Electricity financing should remain within the electricity system mr speaker and so we worked with the you know within the uh, my ministry with officials within the ministry of finance within the treasury board secretariat the the office of the provincial controller cabinet office mr speaker and of course three um, outside audit experts, Mr. Speaker, Answer. to make sure that the range of implementation options were available and our due diligence was completed, Mr. Speaker, and I'll answer more Thank in you. the supplementary. supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. The Premier's $40 billion hydro borrowing scheme will not only drive up hydro bills over the long run, it actually violates public sector accounting standards. Yeah. Emails obtained by the Auditor General prove that government officials knew this from the start when they were designing this scheme. The Premier knew that her private financing scheme would break the rules, but she chose to go ahead anyway and needlessly waste an extra $4 billion. Why is the Premier breaking the rules, wasting billions of dollars, and destroying public trust in government just so she can win an election? Um, I confess to making an error. I should have deferred it through the acting premier the first time, so I will give it to the acting premier to give it back to the Minister of Energy if he wishes. Please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, so let me be clear, and let's let's talk about what two world-class accounting firms had to say in statements about rate-regulating accounting within the public sector accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. KPMG said, on the basis of our extensive research, deliberations, and the opinion from another major major accounting firm, we believe that the accounting policies adopted by the independent electricity system operator are in accordance with the Canadian public sector accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. Deloitte concluded that any regulatory assets and liabilities recognized through the appropriate application of these policies would meet the criteria for recognition under the Canadian public sector accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. And additionally, Ernst & Young is OPG's financial auditor and is consulted on an ongoing basis, Mr. Speaker. When talking about wasting billions of dollars, Answer. their plan, Mr. Speaker, is to buy back millions of shares in Hydro One, and it will not take one cent off electricity bills for Ontario families. They voted against the Fair Hydro Plan. We reduced rates by 25 per cent, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from London North Centre. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Um, speaker, we've known for a long time about the overrepresentation of Indigenous people, racialized people, and marginalized people in our justice system, Speaker. This is a big concern for myself, for our colleagues, and I know for the Attorney General. The current system uh, seems to exclusively look at criminal behaviour and not at things, uh, contributing factors such as homelessness, poverty, mental health or addiction issues. Speaker. There is very simply a lack of a holistic approach. So I think we need to ask ourselves, 
How can we start taking a person-centred approach, help address some of the underlying factors that may be causing people to engage in criminal behaviour? I know in the recent budget we announced a new project called Community Justice Centres. Question. And I'd like to ask the Attorney General, please, to uh, explain how they will lead to a more holistic approach for people. Thank you, Attorney around. General. Thank you very much, Speaker. I thank the member uh, for this uh, important question. Speaker, Ontario is moving forward with creating community justice centres to provide a new and innovative approach to criminal justice that increases access to justice services while reducing barriers faced by vulnerable people, especially people from suffering from mental health or addiction issues. Community Justice Center speaker moved justice out of the traditional courtroom and into a community setting to help connect individuals to critical services that address the root causes of crime before, during, and after entry into the justice system. These centers are hubs that bring together services, justice, health, mental health and addictions, housing, social services, tailored to the unique needs of individual communities. Community Justice Center speaker will strive to ensure that each point of contact with the police or justice system can be an opportunity to provide meaningful intervention that reduces the likelihood of further offending or victimization. This is yes, a part of Ontario's commitment to work together to provide efficient and effective services to communities. Thank you. Supplementary. And thank you to the Attorney General for uh, his answer, but also for making this a priority. Speaker, I'm very optimistic. We've seen CJC's community justice centers established in over 70 different communities around the world, and there's very strong evidence that it re reduces recid recidivism, reduces reliance on incarceration, and enhances community safety and well-being. It's especially important for me because, as the member for London North Centre, one of the three pilots will be located in my community. Speaker, in London, one-third of charges laid in the city are committed by youth between the ages of 18 and 25. I'm very pleased to hear that each location will have community-specific models that will be set up to be best equipped to deal with the community they are located in. Please, Attorney General, Question. can you tell us how the three di different community justice centres will reflect the communities they are placed in? Thank you, Attorney General. Extensive consultation. Our government has identified three community justice centre models in Kenora, London, and Toronto's Moss Park. In Kenora, Speaker Ontario is planning to establish a bicultural community justice centre that has parallel criminal and restorative justice processes. These two streams would, for example, support increased Indigenous leadership in the provision of traditional and restorative justice practices. In Moss Park, Ontario will implement an urban community health and justice centre that focuses on improving the social detriments of health that can lead to contact with the criminal justice system. And special speaker, in London, a youth in transition community justice hub will co connect transition-aged young adults with critical supports at an early age and provide targeted interventions addressing the specific needs of that population. Speaker, overall, this is a $14 million investment yes, in our justice system. And Speaker, I truly worry about if the Conservatives under Doug Ford were to be elected. With their promised billions in cards, I fear Thank that you. projects like these Top may be on the chopping. Thank you. New question? A member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. The York University strike has now gone on for nearly two months, impacting more than 51,000 students. Speaker, a letter from the Vice President, academic, posted recently to the university's website said this. If the strike does not end in time for winter term classes to resume by April 30th, at the latest, there will not be sufficient time to offer all of our summer terms. Speaker, will the minister finally take action to get the 51,000 students back into their classrooms? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. This is obviously a very serious situation as it affects and it impacts students. Uh, I would like to remind the member opposite that York is uh, still open and students are still attending classes as they have been through the duration. Uh, that being said, Mr. Speaker, this government has taken action. The Minister of Labour has appointed an experienced mediator to, um, to bring the, uh, the sides together, to talk to each party 
party and to find a path to resolution, Mr. Speaker. So we are working on this issue and uh, supporting both parties because the best deal is a deal that is made at the table. Uh, we have been urging both sides uh, to come to the table to re resolve their issues. Too many times. The member from Welland is warned. Carry on, please. And to find the compromise that is necessary in the best interest of the students of York University, Mr. Speaker, we've been taking this as a very serious issue and have been working towards uh, supporting both parties to come to yes, a resolution, sir. and we will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back uh, to the Minister, Speaker. Speaker, this could be the last opportunity the Liberal government has to act to save the semester of tens of thousands of students and allow them to graduate in June. Classes are on the verge of being cancelled, Speaker, and many students' summer job placements are at risk. Speaker, why does the minister continue to put thousands of students' lives on hold? Mr. Speaker, um I'd like to inform the House because the member opposite is uh, is not uh, not providing uh, specific and correct information, Mr. Speaker. York University has, uh, in fact, put plans in place. They have been doing so for quite some time, starting first and foremost with keeping the university open so that students can attend classes, Mr. Speaker. And uh, just last week, they announced additional supports so students can either have an assessment on their term or that if they have have experienced hardships that they can come to the university and receive the necessary supports. Mr. Speaker, our concern first and foremost is for the students at York University. We are urging both sides that are involved in this to come back to the table to get a deal that recognizes Answer. that both sides will have to compromise in order to, to reach a deal and put the needs of the students first and foremost, Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Uh, Minister, you will know there are 20 hospitals in this province that are considered medium-sized hospitals. Timmins and District Hospital is one of those hospitals. When they heard the funding announcement that was made by your government that supposedly hospitals were going to get 4.6 percent as an increase, they thought, well, this is going to go a long ways to helping us. The problem is those 20 medium-sized hospitals, because of your health system uh, funding reform, the formula works out such that Timmins and District Hospital doesn't get the full amount, it gets 0.9 per cent. So as a result, our hospital is looking at a deficit next year of close to $5 million, which is going to be catastrophic when it comes to service delivery. Minister, can you tell us what your plan is to address the shortfall in funding these 20 medium-sized hospitals across the province, including the Timmins District Hospital? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we made it very clear that when we talked about a 4.6 overall increase, we meant an average increase. There are many areas of this province with uh, very high growth and tremendous population increases, and so this increase of 4.6 is an average. Uh, obviously, the smaller hospitals uh, uh, have not received necessarily that amount of an increase. Uh, the funding formula is being reviewed and has been reviewed in, an, in a, a manner to increase fairness and equity in terms of the number of patients served, the acuity of the cases. This is done in conjunction with our LINs, in conjunction with the Ontario Hospital Association as well. In fact, the president of that association co-chairs our funding review uh, uh, committee uh, that is made up of representatives, including uh, those from medium-sized hospitals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Madam Minister, these are medium-sized hospitals. These are not the small ones, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to take issue with that. But the point is, is that these hospitals are trying to provide services in an atmosphere where they've cut to the bone already. Timmins and District, as you well know, has done everything, including privatizing their sleep lab, in order to save about $60,000 in an already $66 million budget. So these hospitals have done everything that they can in order to trim out any kind of excesses that don't, they don't need, and we're seeing it when it comes to patient services. You know as well as I do that in the system, when you look at hospital funding, 
the deficit that is incurred by these 20 hospitals is about $400 million. There's a surplus of about $400 million with all of the other hospitals that they get in surpluses. This is a question of shifting the dollars around to make sure that the money is evenly distributed question. so hospitals like TDH don't end up with a deficit and are treated like every other hospital in this province so they can provide the services that people Thank you. need. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate uh, the great efforts of many hospitals in terms of finding efficiencies. And actually, just at this point, I'd like to give a, a shout out to some of our amazing healthcare workers. Uh, my husband was at South Lake Regional Health Center for six days last week, and I can only say that uh, our nurses, our doctors, everybody, the food lady, everybody just shows amazing caring. And uh, I was so impressed by our wonderful healthcare workers. I just wanted to just do that for our very important uh, caring uh, group of people. In terms of continuing to work with uh, the funding formula, uh, the member obviously has brought forward uh, an issue that is of importance to the medium-sized hospitals. Uh, we certainly are committed to continuing Answer. to work to ensure that the appropriate funding is there. Uh, it is certainly our commitment that we provide <laughs> adequate funding for people to receive the type of care they need where they need it. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Education. After inheriting an education system that was underfunded and in, dis and in disre disrepair, a fact that was affirmed by the elementary teachers I met with in my office last week, our government has made it our top priority to invest in teachers, education workers and students, and our publicly funded education system. The focus is to support the people of Ontario, including all students and thousands of staff who support student success. Speaker, Ontario is an international leader in education. We're building new schools in Ontario communities, and we're investing in school-based mental health supports and additional supports for students with special needs. Minister, could you please share what our government is doing to support student achievement and their well-being? Thank you, Minister of Education. Minister responsible for early years in child care. Thank you to the member for this important question. Mr. Speaker, our government is making historic investments in education, including $625 million more in education supports this upcoming year, bringing our investment in education to a historic $24.5 billion. This funding will add 2,000 more education workers in our schools so that children will have access to more mental health workers, guidance counselors, and education assistants. Speaker, we are also equipping students with mental health supports in education, such as coping and resiliency skills, as early as kindergarten. And we're increasing investments in art education to $21 million. This speaks to our top priority of supporting student well-being. In fact, since 2003, our government has added 40,000 education workers to our publicly funded Answer. education system. These investments in education are so important for student well-being and will go where students and educators need it most. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Minister of Education. I am proud to represent a government that cares and is committed to providing opportunity to the people of Ontario. Ontario and access to mental health workers was highlighted by the teachers I met with last week as being paramount for student success. What's clear is that when we hear talks of efficiencies across the aisle, we know that means cuts. We can't afford to go back to a time where education is on the chopping block. In fact, Mr. Speaker, cutting just $1 billion from our schools means thousands of teachers and education workers would be fired. I know that our government is focused on care, not cuts, by providing much uh, providing much needed investments in special education, mental health, and an increase in guidance counselors in our schools. Minister, can you tell us more about inv how investments in education are supporting Ontario Question. students? Thank you. Minister. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the member for this important question. Mr. Speaker, this $24.5 billion investment will mean so much for staff and students. Instead of making cuts, we are making a clear choice to invest in helping our students achieve excellence in Ontario schools. Speaker, we are providing enveloped permanent funding of $300 million over three years to support students with special needs. This funding will clear special 
special education assessment backlogs and wait times while reducing stress on parents, educators, and students. Just think about that. And in addition to more staff, we will be able to support students across the province. This includes social workers, psychologists, speech language pathologists. Speaker, on this side of the House, we know that we need to Answer. invest in our students and invest in our school system and make sure our children are on a strong path to success. Thank you. Question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Frontline mental health care and addiction workers are feeling and struggling uh, with an increasing burden every day in this province. In many places in Ontario, many of those struggling with mental health and addictions don't know where to go for help. In my riding in Nipissing, some head to the Nipissing District Social Service Board office, which is in City Hall in North Bay. One man showed up there last week and promptly collapsed in the hall, unresponsive. EMS was called and he was rushed to the hospital. You can imagine how traumatic this is for the staff and for clients who are present at the same time. After 15 years, Speaker, we shouldn't be at this point. To the Acting Premier, Question. I ask, is this really the legacy the Liberals want to leave? Thank you. Acting Premier. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, uh, we have increased our investments in mental health and addictions dramatically over through, through all the years that we have been involved in government. And of course, our investment in the 2018 budget is a historic investment yep. of some $2.1 billion. Amazing. It's the largest investment in Canadian history in mental health and addiction services. Now, we don't know much about the PC's plan, but we do know that the leader of the official opposition has said that he is going to cut funding for supervised injection sites. Yep. This is obviously uh, an addiction issue. Uh, we know that these harm reduction sites provide wraparound services for some of our most vulnerable people, supports that are saving hundreds of lives. Yes. So, before the member opposite uh, questions our budget, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what they are Answer. considering to do about mental health addictions yeah. other than cutting. cutting. The Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Uh, back to the acting premier. The opioid crisis is well documented, and deaths continue to rise to all-time highs in Ontario. More than a thousand people last year alone. In the northeast Lynn, which encompasses my riding of Nipissing, opioid ca abuse cases and mental health disorders are double the provincial average. The CAO of the Nipissing District Social Services Board believes the local situation is in crisis. The board chair says, quote, too many vulnerable people in our district are suffering needlessly. They are asking our Northeast Lynn to establish and help lead a district crisis task force. Speaker to the acting premier. Will the Minister of Health Question. direct the North East Lynn to work with our local officials and take action on this finally? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm having real difficulty reconciling the question from the member opposite with his leader's comments most recently this last week. Of course, we've been extremely conscious of the opioid crisis, and this is why we're investing $222 million over three years to combat the opioid crisis. And of course, part of our strategy has been expanding harm reduction services, hiring more frontline staff, and improving access to addiction supports across the province. So now, we have made naloxone kits available to pharmacies, public health units, and police and fire services, and we're now making uh, an easy-to-use nasal spray available. Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything that we possibly can to, uh, to combat this public health crisis. We will continue to do so, and Answer. I will take no lessons from the member opposite on this file. New no question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The people who built this province and built our communities deserve comfort and dignity as they age. But too many people in my riding, the Welland riding, and across Ontario cannot get the seniors' care that they need. Over 32,000 people are on the wait lists for long-term care. 
and too many people simply cannot get the seniors' care they need. They can't get it in their own language. They can't get their own foods and cultural activities that they've lived their entire lives to get. Why has the Premier forced seniors to wait longer for long-term care than they need? Thank you. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, we certainly acknowledge that we have a collective responsibility to support our seniors and to ensure the very best quality of life. And that is why our government has almost doubled funding for long-term care since 2003. As health care advancements continue, our population is living longer and developing care needs that are becoming increasingly complex. And so, in our most recent budget, the 2018 budget, we're investing $300 million over three years to increase staffing in long-term care beds. This is, in, of course, in addition to our announcement of 5,000 new long-term care beds over the next four years. We are working hard to ensure our seniors live in safety and dignity. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, after 15 very long years, anything this government wanted to do, they could have and should have done already. But since this government took office 15 years ago, the problems in seniors' care have gotten worse, yep. not better. Nope. Wait times for long-term care have increased by 270 yeah. percent, and families in my riding, the Welland riding, are stuck waiting for care for their grandparents and their parents. With just 45 days left in office, does the Premier uh, regret not making seniors' care a priority and leaving people, seniors across Ontario, without the care that they've badly needed? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, through the years, our plan for health care has been extremely comprehensive, and the member opposite will know that seniors do like to stay in their own home for as long as possible. So our aging at home strategy a number of years ago increased funding for home care, uh, and we have continued to increase that each and every year. When it becomes uh, uh, unfortunately necessary for people to leave their homes, uh, we have strengthened our retirement home community with new regulations in terms of safety and so on. We, of course, have announced our expansion of long-term care beds, some 30,000 new beds over the next decade, and we're continuing to rebuild and refurbish uh, long-term care beds across the province as well. Sir? We have a comprehensive plan. We will continue to ensure our seniors live in safety Thank and dignity. Great Thank answer. you, Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Tobago North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, last week was Earth Week and yesterday was Earth Day. And of course, to celebrate, I encourage community members in my own riding of Etobicoke North to take actions like recycling, taking public transport, as well as reducing energy consumption. I'd also, Speaker, like to compliment the Leader of the Opposition, Doug Ford, for perhaps his only initiative on greenhouse gas reduction, and that is from hiding from the press and getting rid of the media bus that would accompany him across Ontario. I believe that will uh, save on greenhouse gas emissions across all around. Speaker, in Ontario, we're making it easier for everyone to do their part by investing billions in green programs, including $94 million cycling infrastructure, hundreds of million dollars in energy efficiency retrofits for homes, schools, hospitals, social housing, and, and beyond. Speaker, our cap on pollution is $2.4 billion and counting. And despite the unseasonable weather, cold when it's hot, hot when it's cold, unseasonable flooding, Western. there's a complete denial of climate change on the other side. Speaker, I'd ask the minister to please address our government's programs Thank in this area. For the environment and climate change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, uh, and, and thank you to the, uh, the member from uh, Topico North for, uh, for that question, which, which asked so many questions. I wish I had a lot more time to answer them all. I can tell you, Speaker, that on this side of the House, we take the environment very seriously. A cornerstone of our protection of the environment is our protection and our fight against climate change, and that means our cap-and-trade system that we have here in Ontario, which in its first year, in its first year, reduced industrial gas, greenhouse gas pollution, Speaker, and raised $2.4 billion in proceeds, every penny of which we are reinvesting into programs to further reduce greenhouse gas pollution across Ontario. Speaker, I don't think getting rid of the media bus Answer. is a good idea. It takes transparency away. They can't ask the members opposite, do they believe in climate change? Thank you. <laughs> 
The member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd uh, like to introduce some family here from Winnipeg, Manitoba. My niece Teresa Lyons and her friend Cole. Yay! Welcome. We have a deferred vote on the motion of, for second reading of Bill 8, an act to amend the Consumer Reporting Act and the Technical Standings, Standards and Safety Act 2000. Call on the members. This will be a five minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. Pretty, please. That's a plus one answer. On April 12, 2018, Ms. McCharles moved second reading of Bill 8, an act to amend the Consumer Reporting Act, Technical Standards and Safety Act 2000. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Salmaskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmaskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Shubisong. Mr. Shubisong. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Shimanta. Mr. Shimanta. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. <laughs> The ayes are 79, the nays are zero. The ayes being 79, the nays being zero, I declare, declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture du projet de loi. Pursuant to the order of the House dated April 19, 2018, the bill is referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. We have a deferred vote on the government notice of motion number seven relating to the allocation of time in Bill 31, an act implement budget measures, and to enact and amend various statutes. Call on the members, this will be a five minute bill. On April 19, 2018, Mr. Ballard moved government notice of motion number seven relating to allocation of time on Bill 31, an act implement budget measures and to enact an and amend various statutes. All those in favor, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Jass. Ms. Jass. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mrs. Sandals. Mrs. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Renial. Mr. Renial. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Don. Mr. Don. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts.
All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Yuri. Mr. Yuri. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Vanton. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. The ayes are 48, the nays are 32. The ayes being 48 and the nays being 32, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.